Well, looks like the best thing you guys could do for others today would be to sit a little bit closer together. Come on in, sit close together. Looks like it's going to be standing room only. What a great problem to have, huh? Way too many people in church. I know, there are people here haven't seen since they graduated. It's just wonderful. I look, look over there, that's, oh, I hate to forget a name. That's LaVon. That's... Dad, don't point. She's looking over here. But I do remember her. She was the one that won that big award for working all the hours in the SAC clinic. She was a really nice person. Mm hmm she was. Oh, yeah, the SAC clinic. You know, working there during my first year was probably the reason I got through medical school. <laughs> I thought it was because you liked biochemistry so much. <laughs> yeah, you have a point there. But uh, seriously, you know, there was something awesome about being able to help the poor and sick, people who couldn't get help anywhere else. You know, that was the first time I felt like a real doctor, like, like I was making a difference. We hear that a lot from students, that the SAC clinic and going down to the neighborhoods there just really keeps them reminded of why they're going to medicine. Uh, it gives them a feeling of being needed, and they, they, it's just like a little mini uh, mission trip without, without needing to travel. Well, have you been watching the news lately? I don't think you need to leave the Inland Empire to feel like you're helping people. I mean, my dad and I know, well, that that man that lives right near you and mom, right here in Loma Linda, he lost everything. It was, it was terrible. Oh yeah, that was bad, that was bad. I uh, heard from a neighbor that he was really sad. I, I think the whole neighborhood feels bad about it. Yeah. Uh, so, so what'd you do? I mean, he is your neighbor, right? Uh, how'd you help the poor guy? Well, Anthony, we don't really know him very well. And, and, and he, hasn't, he hasn't lived here that long. No, not long, not long. Well, <laughs> only about 13 years. <laughs> no, he couldn't have been here 13 years. He was, he was living there when I was still living at home, and that was 13 years ago. Wow. Time really flies. <laughs> wow. But that's right. That was your cat that he... Uh, your cat went across his lawn right after he moved in, and he, he called animal control. That was crazy. You, you, yeah. you know, I really never liked him after that. Oh, me neither. You, you mean he did that to Fluffy? Yes. Yeah, he did. He did. Oh, okay, okay. And never mind. First, obviously you don't know that guy very well. And, yeah. and besides, come on, who would help a guy they don't really even like? The world out there is a hostile place. A friend and I were driving along the 10 freeway and two cars sped around us in the left lane. They looked like they were racing, but we quickly realized that one had apparently cut the other one off some miles back, and the one who had been cut off was trying to come back and return the favor. The first one was trying to stay ahead of them, and they were really moving quickly. But I guess the one who had done the cutting off realized, I'm never going to beat him. So he pulled in behind another car so that there was no room for the other one to cut him off. The other one came up close on his side and realized that he was caught at that point. He couldn't return the favor. And so he rammed into him. There was glass and chrome and rearview mirrors flying, bouncing all down the freeway. And then the first one returned that favor and rammed into the other. And pretty soon these two cars were banging each other on the way down the 10 freeway, doing about 75 miles an hour. I said to my friend Lee, get off here, get off on the exit. He said, I'm going, I'm going, I'm not staying on this freeway. We took the Waterman exit. The last we saw was these two cars pulling over to the shoulder to bring things to an end. We didn't stick around to see exactly how they resolved the matter. We didn't want to be there if bullets started flying. But we did drive away thinking, it's a hostile world out there. You've got to be careful out there. But it's not just out there. It's also in here and in our homes and in our marriages. Have you discovered that? Gary Smalley tells the story of a husband and wife sitting at the break breakfast table in icy, stony silence. They sat there each staring at their plate, eating their food. Nothing was said. 
But finally, the tension got wound like an overwound guitar string. It was that tight. And finally, the husband looked up and he says, I don't understand it. You don't do for me what you used to do for me. Wife said nothing. You used to greet me in the morning, happy day, all that. No more. You used to fix me hot cereal. Why don't you fix me hot cereal anymore? Well, that one got the wife. She looked up and through clenched teeth, she said, if you want hot cereal... Light your cornflakes on fire. (laughs) I sense just a little bit of tension in the marriage. It's a hostile world out there. It's often a hostile world in here. Some of you have come to worship this morning knowing the reality of that in your own life and experience. There is a family rupture that has fractured your heart. There is a marriage that is falling apart. Your spouse is angry, angrier than words could say, at you. You have a sibling, you have a neighbor, you have a colleague with whom you have had a falling out. And as you come into worship this morning, you come in carrying that heavy burden, thinking the world really is a hostile place. So what do we do in an environment like that, in a setting like that? What do we do for others? What can we do that might be a healing reality in a hostile world? For those of you who are our guests this weekend, we're in a series right now entitled, The Best Thing You Can Do. What we're talking about are those different facets of our lives, those different relationships in our worlds, where there might be a best thing that we can do. We've been considering what Scripture has to say about our life and world. What might be the best thing we can do in many facets of our lives? And today the topic is the best thing you can do for others. So what is that? In the midst of a world that is often hostile, out there and in here, what's the best thing you can do for others. I invite you to take your Bibles to open them to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, your pew Bible, page 1473, Matthew 22. As we land here in the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we land in the midst of conflict and controversy. The foes of Jesus are trying to back him into a corner, give him no way of escape. They either want to be able to hold him up to public ridicule or to point the Romans on him and say, see, he's breaking the Roman law. They think they have him. They take three strikes, three swings at him in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. The first one by the conservative Pharisees, they fail. Second one, by the liberal Sadducees, they fail. And finally, the conservative Pharisees step up again and say, maybe we have a shot on the third strike. The first one is a question about Roman taxes. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus initially says to them, why are you trying to trap me? But then he leads on to the answer, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And the text says they are amazed at his answer. So the Pharisees slink off into the background, and the Sadducees come strutting into the foreground. They have an issue now. They tell a convoluted story about marriage and the resurrection. When Jesus finishes with that one and gives them an answer to that, it says the whole crowd is amazed at what he has to say, and they leave. Well, the Pharisees say one more shot. They come up and they bring to the issue, bring to the fore an issue that has apparently caused no small amount of debate. What is the most important commandment in the law? So read it with me. Matthew chapter 22, we begin reading in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So what about it, Jesus? What is the most important commandment? And Jesus answers by saying, most important commandment of all is love God with everything you are, 
every facet of your being. But he says, I'll throw in another one for free. The second one is just like it. It is bound together by this virtue called love. Second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So there you have it. It is an answer to which they have no reply. It may be the most succinct summary of religion ever. Love God, love others. All the rest is commentary. In fact, truth be told, John will later write in one of his epistles, the way we love God, whom we can't see, is by loving others whom we can And so the two are inextricably bound together. Love for God, love for others. Their question got answered. But here's our question. What is the best thing you can do for others? I would want to suggest to you that it is contained right there in the answer Jesus gives in the second part of it specifically. The best thing you can do for others, obviously, is to love them. But maybe you say, well, wait a minute. To love them. Is that the very best thing? Yes, Jesus says that. Let's declare victory and go home. That's all we need to know. But wait, 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 somebody says. I'm not sure I understand. Could you explain it further? Maybe you saw the Peanuts comic strip. Frame one had Lucy. Her face lit up, her arms spread wide. She says in an almost rapturous joy, I love humanity. Next frame, scrunched up face, balled up fists. She says, it's people I can't stand. (laughs) Well, maybe that's the very issue. Because it seems to me that in this passage, Jesus is not talking about loving humanity. Rather, what he's saying is, do you love your messy roommate? Do you love your critical colleague? Do you love your angry spouse? Seems like Jesus gets very specific many times in his ministry. And here we have no reason to question but that he's doing the very same thing. It's a little hard, Jesus, when you go from generalities to specifics. But maybe we need to understand that word love. When you say love, Jesus, to what exactly do you refer? How are we to show this love? To others, If indeed loving them is the best thing we can do for them, how are we to show it? Well, if you take the Scripture and you peruse the pages of the Bible all the way through, you will quickly realize that there are a myriad of ways to show our love to others. We can show our love by serving. We can manifest our love by giving, by caring by sharing, by listening. There are many various and sundry ways in which we can manifest our love. I want to ask you to narrow your thinking to just one. Because contained in that one is what I think is truly the very best thing we can do for the others in our lives, whether we know them well or not. I would point your focus in the direction of love that manifests itself in kindness. Kindness. Simply by being kind. Maybe you think that's a bit anticlimactic. Kindness is a nice thing, but it's a rather weak and vulnerable virtue. Is it even talked about in Scripture? Well, the truth is, yes, it is. In fact, at times it is used as one of the ways in which love is defined. Just take the New Testament, for example. Go to those immortal words of the Apostle Paul's recorded in 1 Corinthians 13 where he talks about love as he comes to the heart of that passage. As he begins to define what love is, he says, love is patient, love is kind. Or go over to his letter written to the church in ancient Galatia. He writes to them about the fruits of the Spirit, and he says to them, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Or continue reading. Read what he says to the Ephesians. To the Ephesians, he says, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. 
Or you may even want to turn to Colossians, where in Colossians he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to clothe yourselves in kindness. I want you to be recognizable because you are kind. Or you may even want to go to the very end of his ministry. Last epistle he writes to Timothy, his young son in the faith. And to Timothy, he says, speaking about all the others in Timothy's life, not just those who are members of the church, he says, Timothy, don't be quarrelsome, but be kind. Kindness. When you really start to take a careful look at Scripture, you discover that kindness is not only one of the definitions of love, but it is one of the very specific ways in which the virtue called love can be applied in all of our relationships, those with whom we are the closest and those we don't know at all. Simply being kind. Now you may have some doubts. You may say, Randy, it's a hostile world out there. Truth is, we have a culture that has become crude and vulgar and angry. It is a culture where darkness seems to rise up and we don't know what to do. And here we are, arrayed against the spiritual forces of darkness in the high places. And you come along and you say, one of the ways we can combat that is be kind. Please, Randy, please. Give us something more robust, more meaty, more big and brawny and beefy than just kindness. That seems so weak, so vulnerable, even if it does grow out of love. Well, I understand your point. But I also know that at least in smaller things, kindness can go a long way. I know that from personal experience. I remember that day back when Miranda was still a babe in arms. It was dad and daughter that day in the coach section of the airplane. This was going to be an adventure. This was scary. When Anita was with us, she knew what to do. Everything was cared for. But suddenly, it's dad and daughter. And so we made our way back almost to the last row of the airplane. That's where they put us. We came along, and I was holding Miranda. She was getting a bit fussy already. And as I made my way into the row and sat down, there was a woman seated directly in front of me, a woman who had a rather plastic look. She took one look at a man with a baby. She watched me go by. She kind of stood up to see where I was going to sit. And when I sat down right beside her, she went, Oh, great. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, this could be a long flight. Well, I don't know if it was some kind of divine justice or divine retribution. Because no sooner did we take off than Miranda began to cry. And then she began to scream. And then she wept. I suspect she had colic. Cried and cried. And this woman in front of me was getting more angry and more obvious about her anger the longer it went. I tried everything Anita had taught me. I tried rocking her back and forth. I tried playing with her. I got up and decided, well, I know what I'll do. I'll walk the aisle of the plane. That way we can share the joy with everyone. (laughs) Nothing worked. I finally went in the bathroom and closed the door. I thought, maybe this will muffle the sound. But poor little Miranda continued to cry and to scream. And the lady in front of me, continued to get more and more angry and more obvious about her anger. I was in the galley of the plane by that time trying to walk back and forth and trying to calm Miranda down when a woman who was seated across the aisle from me got up and she came back to me, the back of the plane, and she laid her hand on my arm and she said, Many of us are parents. We understand. You're doing just fine. And don't pay any attention to her. (laughs) I didn't say it, but I was tempted. I almost said, could you hold me for a minute? (laughs) I thought it's going to be terrible when we land and people say, we were on board with a screaming baby the whole flight. But that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was the bawling father. (laughs) And 
And that simple touch, those simple words, it's okay. Don't mind her. Kindness made a difference in my day. So I know, I understand, it can make a difference in small ways. Gandhi, boarding a train. Train was already moving, boarding with some of his followers and his friends. Jumped on the train as the train moved out. But as he jumped on the train, one of his shoes slipped off and fell onto the track. Gandhi, trying to hold the train, immediately reached down to try to scoop up the shoe before it got away from him. Missed. And they stood and looked back as the shoe slowly began to move behind them. Just a second, two seconds, Gandhi reached down and slipped off his other shoe and threw it so that it landed near the first. And one of his companions said, Why did you do that? And Gandhi said, I don't know. Now some poor man will find not one he can't use, but two he can. Kindness. I know that it makes a difference to others in the small areas and the small ways of our lives. In fact, just this past week, I read about a drive through coffee shop in Portland, Oregon, just to the north of us. It seems that the manager that morning was working at the window, and a customer came through the window and paid for her mocha. But then she said, listen, I'd like to pay for the mocha in the car behind me and gave the manager some extra money. It was a nice touch, a kind touch. Next car came, the manager served the mocha, said there'll be no charge. Lady in that car that just left paid for it. Really? Well, then I'd like to pay for the person in that car. And so that customer paid for the third car. Third car did the same, as did the fourth, the fifth, the tenth, the fifteenth, the twentieth, the twenty-fifth. Twenty-seven customers over a two-hour period did not break the chain. It's just a simple act. Kindness. But somehow it stands up in the face of a culture that is too often vulgar, too often crude, too often used to being mistreated. And then we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, can you tell us what is the best thing we can do for others? Jesus says, that's very clear. Love God, love others. That's the entire duty. That's what my religion is all about. But Jesus, can you be a bit more specific? How do we love? Well, Jesus could go on for a long time about that. But somewhere embedded in what he would say would be this. Be kind. Be kind to others. Because kindness, though it is a weak and a vulnerable virtue, has the ability to stand tall in the face of some of the grossest darkness. Do you wonder about that? You say, okay, Randy, I, I understand. It can make a difference in the small things. But the small things isn't what life is all about. They're also the very big things. Surely we need something more brawny, more robust when it comes to those things. More powerful, not a vulnerable virtue like kindness. May 2003, the Indonesian Survey Institute reported some interesting numbers. Indonesia, the most populous Muslim nation on the planet, reported some interesting numbers. It said those who favorably viewed the United States numbered about 15%. Those who not only unfavorably viewed the United States but reported that their response was highly unfavorable numbered 48%. The rest fell at different places. That was May 2003. December 2004. You may remember what happened that December. You may remember that devastating tsunami that wiped out parts not only of that country but other neighboring countries as well. Not only thousands but tens of thousands dead. After the tsunami, the aid, the help poured in. 
not only to Indonesia, but to neighboring countries as well. Much of that aid coming from people like you who call Jesus friend. The aid poured in. The relief workers showed up. They said, what can we do? How can we help? How can we help recreate your life, your society, help to heal you, help to feed you? A few months later, the Indonesian Survey Institute reported some numbers. They reported that those who viewed the United States in a highly unfavorable way had fallen from 48% to 13%. Those who viewed the United States favorably had risen from 15% to 44%. Further, it reported the support for terrorist activity was at the lowest point since 9-1-1. Interesting. Interesting what kindness can do. Whether you are a woman laying a reassuring hand on the arm of a distraught father, or whether you are a church that rises up and says, they are our brothers, they are our sisters, we must help them. We must go to their aid in some way and let them know that because they are creations of Jesus, we love them. Kindness. It seems such a weak Vulnerable virtue in the face of all that we experience in a dark and hostile world. But do you believe that kindness has the ability to actually change the trajectory of a person's life? I just finished the book this past week, gripping, not for the young or the tender of heart, but an important book. The title of the book is simply Slave, subtitled My True Story authored by Mende Nazar and Damian Lewis. It is Mende's story. Mende, a young African girl, not sure, probably about 12 years old. Her tribe didn't keep track of birthdays, so they weren't sure. But going back and reconstructing the events of her life, she was probably about 12 years old when the raiders, the marauders, descended upon her village. And with flame and with hatchet and with sword, they brought about murder and mayhem. Mende was one of the young girls who was grabbed, kidnapped, taken and sold into abject slavery. Every day of every week, of every month, of every year that followed, Mende was subject to harsh labor, to difficult times, to beatings, to some of the most inhumane realities a human being can face. There were possibilities at times, maybe of talking to someone, someone who might not betray her, possibilities of escape here or maybe there, but they were few and far between, and she didn't have the courage to try. In fact, the longer she was there, the more beaten down she became, coming to the point where she was a shriveled up version of her former self, not even believing that she was worth saving or freedom. But she wrote the book, so something happened. The question is, what? What was it that gave her the courage to finally make a break for it, to risk it all? Were Mende to stand here today, she would tell you the courage came. It really was born. It had to grow some after that, but it really was born one day on a bus. As she sat on a bus next to a gentleman she had met just recently. And as that gentleman talked to her, talked to her as though she were a human being, listened to her, asked her questions, realized some of what she was experiencing and said to her, that is illegal. They cannot do that to you. She would say, Did she stand here today? There was one reality 
that really was the birth of new hope for me. It was His kindness. Kindness. In the midst of a life where everybody yelled and screamed or just ignored her, suddenly somebody looked her in the eye and said, you are a worthwhile human being. Somebody was kind. It's a vulnerable virtue. It's a weak virtue. It's one that so quickly runs into hiding, scared away by abruptness and sharpness and crude people. It runs too quickly. Because I have a suspicion that if this undergirding fertile soil called love, love for the other, allows the little plant of kindness to begin to grow, that plant will grow until it takes over the garden. Kindness. What is the best thing we can do for others? Jesus says the best thing we can do for others is to love them. About that, let there be no question. But as I read the New Testament, I realize there are many ways that that love can be described, explained, and applied. But maybe one of the most important of those ways, maybe the best thing you can do for others, is to allow that love of God to make you a kind person. What about it? Are you up to the task? Are you willing this week to ask the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of His grace, to so, so take hold of your heart that kindness will grow in your life? Young person, are you willing on the playground at school to speak to that child who's being bullied by the others? Parent. Are you willing, when the gossip comes around, which it does so quickly in a community like this, are you willing to stop it when it meets you? Are you willing not only to ask, is it true, but also to ask, is it kind? Are you willing, in fact, to walk through your world, through your life this week, just sowing random acts of wonderful kindness wherever you go? In fact, what if you did amazing things but simple things. Took a roll of quarters, went into a nearby laundromat, and just left it on one of the dryers. What if you bought a gift certificate, certificate from Stater Brothers and dropped it in the mailbox of a needy family? What if everywhere you went in your life, you sowed random acts of kindness? In fact, what if this church community became so known for its kindness that people in the community around us may shake their heads and say, I'm not sure what they believe, but let me tell you, those are some good people. Wouldn't it be the answer to that prayer that you've heard before, prayed by the little girl who said, Oh God, please make the bad people good and the good people nice. <laughs> kindness. It just may be the best thing you can do for others. Because the truth is, it does not matter how much we fine-tune our theology. It doesn't matter how many advanced degrees we earn. It doesn't matter how many times we are in church or how many hours we spend reading Scripture. None of that matters if somehow the love of Jesus doesn't invade my heart and make itself obvious by loving others. And in that love, by being kind.